Welcome to Lecture 1 on the Euler Characteristic. This is the first in a series of preparatory lectures for the online course on topological data analysis to be offered in fall 2013. For more information about the course, please check out the website math.uiowa.edu backslash tilde i darcy backslash applytopology.html. Today we will start with counting. But what we are interested in counting are vertices, edges, and faces. A vertex is just a zero-dimensional point. An edge is a one-dimensional line segment connecting two vertices. If three edges form a triangle, we can fill in that triangle with a two-dimensional surface, which we will call a face. One can also have more general faces, like square faces, but for this lecture and the next lecture, we will stick to triangles. So all our faces will be triangles. In the example on the right, we have seven vertices, nine edges, and two faces. In one of the simpler examples, we have a triangle with three vertices, three edges, and one face. We can subdivide this triangle, so we now have six vertices, nine edges, and four faces. We're interested in the Euler characteristic. The Euler characteristic can give us information about the shape of an object. In its simplest form, the Euler characteristic is just the number of vertices minus the number of edges plus the number of faces. Or in shorthand, if we use the Greek letter chi to represent the Euler characteristic, capital V for set of vertices, capital E for set of edges, capital F for set of faces, as well as the absolute value notation to denote the number of elements in a set, then we can use this shorthand formula for the Euler characteristic, just number of vertices minus number of edges plus the number of faces. For our triangle example, when we have three vertices, three edges, and one face, we do three minus three plus one, so the Euler characteristic of the triangle is one. Notice that when we subdivide the triangle, we still get an Euler characteristic of one. Six vertices minus nine edges plus four faces still gives us an Euler characteristic of one. It is easy to see that subdividing a triangle does not change the Euler characteristic. First, we added three additional vertices. These three vertices subdivided three of the edges, plus we have three more edges, and these three additional edges created three additional faces. So to go from our simple triangle to our subdivided triangle, we add three additional vertices, as well as six additional edges, and three additional faces. Since 3 minus 6 plus 3 is 0, our Euler characteristic does not change. Still have an Euler characteristic of 1. Another operation that does not change the Euler characteristic is adding a triangle in this manner. So I've added this small triangle where this edge agrees with one of the other edges. So note that what I've done is I've added one new vertex, two new edges, one new face. Well, one minus two plus one is equal to zero, so the Euler characteristic does not change when I add a triangle in this manner. Well, what the Euler characteristic tells us is it gives us some information about the topology of an object. When you went to kindergarten, you learned that a square was different than a circular disk was different than a triangle. Well, you can go to graduate school in mathematics to learn that a square is the same thing as a circular disk, is the same thing as a triangle, if we're interested in the topology of the object. So topology is frequently called rubber geometry or clay geometry, because in topology, we are allowed to stretch objects, and that doesn't change the topology. We can twist them around, and we still have the same topology. What we're not allowed to do is glue things together. I've just now created this hole here, and so that's changed the topology. I'm also not allowed to tear things too, because I've now removed the hole and again changed the topology. 
but any sort of deformation. So if I start off with this object here, and I just want to manipulate it a little bit, so maybe I'll take this object, which is currently a donut, also called a solid torus. I can start pushing down, for example. So I'll push down and push down. And so if I continue pushing down and continue manipulating and manipulating and manipulating, well, eventually I come up with a coffee cup. So a coffee cup and a donut are topologically equivalent. That makes topology conferences just a little bit messy. You see, I can't tell the difference between a donut and a coffee cup. Thus, I often think the donuts are a little stale, and the coffee cups don't really hold coffee. So that's what topology is. We are allowed nice deformations, nice stretching, nice twisting. We just can't tear. We just can't glue. Uh, but if we do the nice deformations, we do not change the topology. There are different levels of equivalence. For example, a differential topologist would care about the derivative. So a differential topologist would care about sharp corners. We, however, will ignore the derivative. So sharp corners are fine, and we can deform the sharp corner to, create, to go from a triangle to a circular disk, or add sharp corners to go from a circular disk to a square. So to us, a square, a circular disk, and a triangle are all topologically equivalent. How you triangulate an object does not affect its topology. So these two triangles, they're both triangles, they're topologically the same. Recall that subdividing a triangle did not affect the Euler characteristic. In fact, no matter how you triangulate an object, its Euler characteristic will be the same. Another operation, remember, that did not affect the Euler characteristic is adding a triangle in this manner so that one of its edges agreed with one of the older edges. That did not affect the Euler characteristic. It also doesn't change the topology. By adding these triangles, we can do these nice deformations that don't change the topology and also do not change the Euler characteristic. These two, subdividing the triangle and adding this triangle, show us that the Euler characteristic is a topological invariant. That means if two objects are topologically the same, they will have the same Euler characteristic. Thus, if we need to know the Euler characteristic of any object on this page, we only need to calculate the Euler characteristic of one of them because they will all have the same Euler characteristic. That also tells us that the Euler characteristic of a circle is one as it's the same as a triangle since they're both topologically equivalent. To emphasize this fact, the Euler characteristic is a topological invariant. So if we have two objects that are topologically the same, such as a triangle and a circle, they will have the same Euler characteristic. Some additional examples of Euler characteristic are the sphere. The sphere is the boundary of a three-dimensional ball. If you think about an orange, it would be the orange peel, but an orange peel with no thickness. So a surface does not have any thickness. This has Euler characteristic two. So the Euler characteristic of a sphere is two. If we fill in and take the entire three-dimensional ball, including the inside here, we will have Euler characteristic one. So the Euler characteristic of a three-dimensional ball will be one. If we take the Euler characteristic of a two-dimensional disk, we also get an Euler characteristic of one, as well as if we calculate the Euler characteristic of a one-dimensional closed interval, we also get an Euler characteristic of one. Note, however, that these three objects are topologically different. You cannot change the dimension uh, and preserve the topology. So I can take this three-dimensional ball and I can flatten it quite a bit, but I can't flatten it so much that I change its dimension. So if you change the dimension, you do change the topology. So a three-dimensional ball is topologically different than a two-dimensional disk, which is topologically different than a one-dimensional closed interval. They do, however, all have the same Euler characteristic of one. What that tells us 
is that the Euler characteristic is not a perfect invariant. We can have objects with the same Euler characteristic, but they are not topologically equivalent. As another example, let's take a zero-dimensional point. Here we just have a single point. I can't change a single point by pulling or stretching to make an infinite number of points. A line segment contains an infinite number of points, as does a two-dimensional disk. So I can see that there's no way to stretch a zero-dimensional point to become an infinite number of points. So I can't go from a zero-dimensional disk to a one-dimensional line segment or to a two-dimensional disk and preserve the topology. These are all topologically different, but they all have the same Euler characteristic of one. One thing that does preserve the Euler characteristic but can change the topology is a deformation retract. The formal definition of here is here, but we will illustrate that with an example. So I will start off with a two-dimensional disk on the left, and I will deform it to such a degree that I push it onto a zero-dimensional point. I have changed its topology because I went from an infinite number of points that created this disk, and I pushed it onto this zero-dimensional point onto a single point changing its topology. But since I did this via a deformation retract, via this nice pushing, I have not changed its Euler characteristic. So if two objects, if one object is a deformation retract of the other, they will have the same Euler characteristic. As a second example, we can take a look at the blue annulus on the right, and I can push the blue annulus onto one of its boundary components, so pushing that blue annulus onto one of its one-dimensional boundary components shows me that the annulus will have the same Euler characteristic as a circle, since I, the circle is a deformation retract of my annulus. To see that again, I can do a deformation retract of my two-dimensional disk onto a zero-dimensional single point. So they will have the same Euler characteristic. Similarly, I can push my two-dimensional annulus onto a one-dimensional circle, one of its boundary components, so they will have the same Euler characteristic. Here we have several examples of objects with the same Euler characteristic. The Euler characteristic of the circle is zero, we will leave that as a homework assignment. Given that the Euler characteristic of a circle is zero, we know that the Euler characteristic of an annulus will also be zero since we can push an annulus onto a circle. Similarly, we get the Euler characteristic of a Mobius band is also zero because you can push a Mobius band onto the circle, changing its topology but via this deformation retract, preserving the Euler characteristic. The Euler characteristic of a solid torus, also thought of sometimes as a donut, is also equal to one because we can also push onto this circle here as well. So all four objects, these four objects up top here, all have Euler characteristic zero because these three objects, annulus, Mobius band, and solid torus, we can do a deformation retract to get a circle which has Euler characteristic zero. Our last example is the torus. That's one of the more interesting examples. The torus is the boundary of the two-dimensional torus. So it's, if I remove the inside and just look at the surface boundary here, I get the torus. So if I think about the solid torus as the donut, then the torus, if I completely cover it with, say, chocolate frosting, so completely cover it with frosting here, so it's completely covered, then my torus would be the frosting on the donut. Sometimes when people say torus, sometimes they will mean the solid torus via context, but the real definition, the standard definition, is that the torus is the frosting, it's the surface of the solid torus. And that also has Euler characteristic zero. 
That's quite interesting because we can't do a deformation retract. So this is topologically very different than any of these preceding objects. We could, you know, deform it. It was a very strong deformation. We did a deformation retract onto this circle here, changing its topology but preserving the Euler characteristic. With this boundary, this, the torus S1 cross S1, circle cross circle, so circle cross a circle right here, I can't deform that onto a circle, so topologically it's very different, but it still has the same Euler characteristic as all the other objects on this page. Another example is the Euler characteristic of the solid double torus will be minus one. We can see that via deformation retract onto this graph with three vertices and four edges, 3 minus 4 is minus 1, so its Euler characteristic is minus 1 for both the solid double torus as well as for this graph here. The last example is the Euler characteristic of the surface, the boundary of this solid double torus, is going to be minus 2. So if I take again just a look at the boundary, that Euler characteristic will be minus 2. We can see that by triangulating our surface. Uh, that takes quite a bit of work, so we will leave that to the enthusiastic reader to confirm. While the Euler characteristic is not a perfect invariant, we actually can use the Euler characteristic to identify orientable surfaces without boundary. So for example, if I know I have an orientable surface without boundary, if I calculate the Euler characteristic and I get two, then I know that I have the sphere. If its Euler characteristic is zero, then I know I have the torus right here. If the Euler characteristic is minus two, then I know I have the genus two torus. If the Euler characteristic is minus four, I've got the genus three torus. And remember, we're talking about the surface now of each of these objects. Also, if I know the number of boundary components, I can also use the Euler characteristic to identify any orientable surface, as long as I know the number of boundary components. Similar results also hold for non-orientable surfaces. Another application of the Euler characteristic is to graphs. A graph is a collection of vertices as well as some edges. So it's an object, a complex that is, contains vertices and edges. We just do not allow triangles, so no faces. A tree is a connected graph that does not contain a cycle, so no cycles. So this graph in the middle is not a tree because it contains this cycle right here. In a cycle, I start at one vertex and I go around not repeating any vertices until I return to the starting vertex. And if I return to the starting vertex, I have now created a cycle. So here we also have a cycle here and we also have a cycle that's a bit longer too. So the graphs on the right are not trees, but the graph on the left, this thing is a tree. Notice it also has Euler characteristic one. If we do have a tree, its Euler characteristic will be equal to one. We can see that via a deformation retract onto a single vertex, but let's look at that another way to illustrate some additional things about the Euler characteristic and graphs. So in this example, we're gonna start off with two vertices. So the Euler characteristic is two, and note that we also have two components. If I add an edge, my Euler characteristic has now been reduced to be one. So my Euler characteristic is one, and I also have one component. I'll now add a vertex, so I've increased the number of components to two, and my Euler characteristic is also two. Adding an edge reduces my number of components to one and also reduces my Euler characteristic to be one. As long as I don't have cycles, my Euler characteristic for a graph will be the number of components of my graph. So let's continue adding a vertex and a edge. 
which does not change our Euler characteristic. Add another vertex and an edge, we still have an Euler characteristic of one. Add three vertices and three edges, we still have our Euler characteristic equal to one. We will now add an edge that creates a cycle. Notice that our Euler characteristic is now zero, but we still do have one component. If I add another edge, I have now reduced my Euler characteristic to be now minus one. We can also use our Euler characteristic to determine the number of cycles in our graph as well. We will talk more about cycles in the next lectures. Thank you.